It's 10 degrees outside as I came in. Um, it is right now, as I checked it, it's about 1 o'clock in Honolulu. It's 78 degrees, partly cloudy. So if you want to do another, a nice you know, juxtaposition, how do I know that? My brother lives there. I just called him about a half an hour ago. And he is, and he is a, do you know the word Howley? Anybody know that word? He's a resident Howley. And it is a, it's, truth floats right below humor. And it always does. And Howley is a white guy, you know, living on the Hawaiian Islands. And my brother for the longest time was in the military. And there's always the notion, that, oh, here comes that Howley. And it was you white guys who overthrew our queen in, in 1891, you know, Queen, actually, in 1893, Queen Lili Uwalakalani. I can't say that too often without having my tongue recoil, all right? But I'll try it one more time. It's Queen, Ili U, Queen Lili Uwalakalani. And we've got, so it's the, so we have the Queen of Hawaii will be overthrown by the sugar planters, by the missionary boys in, in, 18, in 1893. So let me stop for a second and just frame the, the storyline here, or at least where the storyline is today. This year marks the 55th anniversary of the, not, not the annexation, the 55th anniversary of Hawaii becoming a state in August of, uh, in August of 1959. In, in, yeah, in August of 1959. The Hawaii is the only state in the Union in which Caucasians are a minority. It, it also is the, and I can't figure this out, but thank you, Daniel, I'm sure for Hawaiians, thank you, Senator Inouye, that it, has, it is part of the interstate highway system. Now, I don't know anyone who's driven to Hawaii <laughs> from Massachusetts. That being said, it's part of the interstate highway system. Uh, they also no longer export sugarcane to any great extent. It's simply too labor intensive, too expensive. And what little sugarcane is harvested on the eight Hawaiian islands is converted into ethanol. And today the major exports are coffee and macadamia nuts, which I loathe. They have no flavor. And, and the basic industry is tourism, tourism, and then the military again. All right, so my, my son just returned from a, a visit, this, I think it was yesterday, with his family the day before to the Hawaiian Islands. I've yet to speak with him, but I'm sure he's going to flaunt his tan. And that's okay. You know, being a, a hardy New Englander, we can all take, you know, 10 degrees above zero today. So the, and, and by the way, when statehood was, was when statehood was, adopted when statehood was presented to the people of Hawaii, the, the vote to accept statehood was 94%, all right? And the reason why it was so, at 94%, the reason why it was overwhelming is that 1959, we are at the very heart of the Cold War. And the protection that the United States could offer, both militarily and also getting tied in fully to the American economic system in that global economy. So there were military concerns, there were uh, economic concerns, and also the long history that the Kingdom of Hawaii had had with the United States, beginning, beginning around 1820, maybe 1825, when a group of Calvinist missionaries from the Park Street Church in downtown Boston and got it in their heads that we need to you know, we need, to, we, we need to bring Christianity. We need to bring the American alphabet. We need to bring English. We need to bring America to, to the kingdom of Hawaii. And, and this is the beginning of the, of the missionaries arriving in the Hawaiian Islands. And they bring the alphabet. Uh, they bring English. They bring, they bring mosquitoes. And they also bring if you will, the white, the, 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 they bring the responsibility of the white man's burden. And, and, and that is such a negative term today. But nonetheless, we need to Christianize these heathens. You know, they are without God. Look at the way they dress. And of course, to the utter, to the utter, not bafflement, but to, to the shock of the early missionaries, this hula dance has got to go. I mean, it is too provocative. It is too suggestive. And talk about being Eurocentric. 
not understanding that it's part of the storytelling tradition and it's part of the culture, more so than Arthur Godfrey's ukulele. Remember that he made a bit of a, he was a nasty man, by the way, Arthur Godfrey. Uh, he had a public persona and a private persona. So it will be the missionaries, you know, who will bring many items along with the mosquito. And it will be the Hawaiian, the, the people of Hawaii for the longest time had remained on the very, very fringe of any kind of contact with, uh, with, with, with the West at all. I mean, Hawaii is one of the most remotest places in the Pacific. It's hard to get from here to there. And they had, and they had benefited you know, from that isolation. And it wasn't until after the American Revolution in 1778, in fact, that Captain James Cook rediscovered, or discovered, if you will, you know, the Hawaiian Islands, and then, and then came the rest of the world. You may have, in another lifetime, have read James Michener's Hawaii. And that is a long read. That's the kind of the book you take when you're flying to Hawaii. It takes you that long to read it. And, and he brings it back right to the beginning with the volcanic eruptions and the Polynesians, you know, rowing across half the world, you know, to find these eight islands. So that's where our story begins here with the missionaries. And Queen, I'll call her Queen Lily, and not to be disrespectful, it's just a lot easier, that she is to the manor born, a native Hawaiian, full-blooded Hawaiian, and she, attains, she attends the missionary schools, and she learns to speak perfect English and to write perfect English. Many of her poems are still read today uh, by, by native Hawaiians or those who are interested in the local tradition. She wrote the national anthem for the Hawaiian people. She was born in 1836 and attended the missionary schools, and in order to, 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 to bring her into the fold, if you will, that she's given a new name. It's, it's a great wasp name, that she is Lydia, Lydia. And, and Lydia will, will, as she matures, Lydia will marry one of the sons of the, of the missionaries, and his name is John Dominus, and I have a, and have a reason of mentioning that that she will be now known as Lydia Dominus, and a very dutiful, quiet lady-in-waiting. Her brother, her brother, Kalakaua, you know, David Kalakaua, is the king of the Hawaiian Islands. And the, the way, it, the, way the, the people in the land interacted in the Hawaiian Islands is that it was very futile, and that the the, the native Hawaiians, I mean, did not own the land per se. That each of the eight islands, uh, 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 the Hawaiian archipelago, had a, had a chief, if you will, for lack of a better term, and he allocated, it was always a he, he allocated the land, and in return for their loyalty to him, one worked a small parcel of land and made ends meet. And while you might be cash poor, and the notion of having money is such a, a, a foreign concept, and in fact it truly was. I'll get back to that in a moment. Now, you may be cash poor, but at least you have the land. And it may be a small parcel, but it made ends meet, and, and, and you, you lived a full life as a Hawaiian subject. And even in the Hawaiian language today, or certainly back then, there was no word for owning land. It was almost a communal situation. So when these, when the, when the missionary boys, when the missionary boys came to buy land, buying land was foreign. And the only connection we have with that is that, and it begins right here in, in, in Massachusetts and, and rolls out of steam in California, and that is among Native Americans, among, among Indians, that most of the tribes had no concept either of land ownership. It was, it was held in, in common, it was a communal ownership. I mean, holding land was as foreign a concept as owning, owning, as owning water, as, as, as selling air, if you will. We all use it together. So the notion of land ownership was foreign. And also, I want to make this point as well, 
you know, that just as Native Americans were brought into, brought onto the reservations and went to Indian schools where their names were changed and they, and they accepted Christianity and they also wore the clothing of their conquerors, if you will, Men, much of that happened to the people of Hawaii as well. And as we get to the very end of the century, and as, we, as our storyline begins to evolve, that it gets caught up with, coming back to the United States, it gets caught up with a number of, of events that are going on here. One is this, that in 1890, the United States ran out of frontier. Now, there was no more land on the, on the census returns labeled frontier. So what's the next great adventure? You know, we've settled the land. We've gone from one rock, Plymouth Rock, to another rock, Alcatraz, all right? And we've gone from sea to sea. So what's the next great adventure? It's colonialism, to bark with the big dogs, as the Europeans are, certainly the Germans, the French, and the Brits. Also part of that is that the, again, the missionaries spreading, you know, Christianity in, into the, uh, across the Pacific. Something else is going on as well, is that American entrepreneurs are looking for new markets. And we've run out, of, we haven't run out of markets. We want to expand our markets, you know, into Asia. And there are the Hawaiian Islands, which were out there, and we knew they were there, the United States of America in 1842, recognize the, the Kingdom of Hawaii, and you heard it right, 1842, and with that recognition and the fact we're no longer a, we, 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 we want to bark with the big dogs and be an imperial power, we need new markets, we want to be a military power as well. You might remember from school days, an author, an author by the name of Alfred, not an author, he was a, he was a captain in the United States Navy, and we'll be able to, to catapult this book into being appointed an admiral. And you may remember dimly a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Anybody? By good. Alfred Thayer Mahan, M-A-H-A-N. And Mahan talked about that. Mahan made the case that all great nations, and he brought it all the way back to the Greeks and then the Egyptians and, and so forth, that at least at that moment, all great nations had been naval powers as well, whether it's the Phoenicians and, or the Romans and the Greeks, albeit it's just in the Mediterranean, and then later on the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, and the British, that all great nations had empires. And those empires were safeguarded and patrolled by a navy. And if we are going to bark with the big dogs at the turn of the century, we need a two ocean navy. And there is that beautiful halfway, more than halfway across the Pacific. You know, there are the Hawaiian Islands and the anchorage of Pearl Harbor. And all of this is coming together in the perfect storm as the missionary boys. So the, and two in particular, uh, Thurston Howell and Lauren, uh, Lauren, Lauren Thurston, rather. I got him mixed up. Lauren Thurston and Sanford Dole are going to begin to organize a program to, to bring about the annexation of the Hawaiian Islands. Now, why do they want to do that? They want to do that because they have been buying up land hand over fist from Hawaiians who really have no concept of what's going on here. And the lands are being sold for 25 cents a parcel. And what's going on among the sugar growers, the sugar planters, is they're buying this piece and that piece and that piece and that piece, and they're combining them, you know, into an agribusiness, and then they're irrigating them, and then they're fencing them, and then suddenly these, these local Hawaiians who own, or not own, but this is our little strip of land, and this is our little strip of land, and suddenly it's fenced, it's irrigated, it's being patrolled, and they're being kicked off their land. They don't, they don't understand this, but they're being kicked off the land. They have one of two options. Either work the land as, as cutting sugarcane, which is labor intensive. And along with that, not understanding, but why are we working this land? What have we done? We own this land. Well, we don't own it, but we've had this land almost in perpetuity from family, from, from generation to generation. 
Most of the local Hawaiians refuse to cut sugar cane. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the pay is 10 cents an hour. The, the plantations are being patrolled by, by horseback riders with whips. Sounds like slave days. And by the way, slavery was not even a condition on the Hawaiian Islands situation. So, so the, the very few who, who, who work remain in, in this very difficult situation. Most go to the cities. And their whole way of life is being slowly transformed as we get to the 1850s and 1860s. A Hawaiian League, there are two annexationist groups. The, the annexationist club, that pretty much speaks for itself, doesn't it? The annexationist club, and then the Hawaiian League. And the two leaders are, are, are again, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be Dole, so you know, Sanford Dole and Lauren Thurston. So these two groups, you know, that, that are looking to seize the land and seize power and have the United States annex the Hawaiian Islands. Now, why do they want that? Because if the United States annexed the Hawaiian Islands, it means that tariffs that were typically high on Hawaiian sugar getting to the United States, those tariffs will be either reduced enormously or they will be eliminated altogether. Remember, the United States grows sugar as well. So sugar growers, you know, in the, certainly in the Louisiana area and so forth, they don't want any competition from Hawaiian sugar because it's one, it's competition, and two, it's a better quality. So these, so the Annexationist Club and the Hawaiian League, you know, they're looking to have the Hawaiian Islands annexed. And they have friends back in the United States Congress. And, and again, all part of this is trade with Asia. What's the next frontier now that we've run out of the American frontier? You know, what's, what's the new, you know, uh, the, the missionaries looking to, you know, to spread their, to spread their missionary work in, into China as well. So all of this is coming together. And the Sons of Liberty, if you will, the muscle, the muscle for the Hawaiian League and the muscle for the Annexationist Club is provided by the Honolulu Rifles. It sounds like a rock group, doesn't it? The Honolulu Rifles, which reminds me, it just popped into my head, that if one watches Hawaii Five-0, do you know why it's called Hawaii Five-0? It's so lame. It's so unimaginative. Hawaii is the 50th state. So, I mean, can you imagine lack of imagination? What are we going to call this? Let's call it, I have no idea. It's the 50th state. Beautiful, beautiful. We've had an epiphany. Hawaii 5 0. And, and the, the, the notion of these young Hawaiian children, you know, on their ukuleles, you know, doing da 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 da. I mean, it, it's almost like the tune of imperialism, you know, American imperialism, and they're smiling and celebrating, and as my brother reminds me. So we have the annexationists, we have the Hawaiian League, we've got the muscle here in the Honolulu Rifles, and we have a, the, and again, we, you know, using American terms, uh, you know, your ethnocentric terms, we have the King of Hawaii, who will be the predecessor to, to Queen Lily. We have the, queen, the King of Hawaii, and his name is Kalakaua. And he is a, he spends a lot of money, he likes to travel. He runs into debt. And the missionary boys are willing to sidle up to the king and to loan him money from their profits on the sugar and from other monies that they have. Now, Kalakaua doesn't quite get it. I mean, he is a party guy. When he had his birthday, they would go on for two or three weeks. He just didn't get it. And he's trying to govern these eight islands as well. And, and now that the white folk have, have showed up, that they're beginning to complicate matters. And loyalties and monies and those who are going to collaborate with the enemy, the occupiers, are beginning to infiltrate and undermine uh, Kalakaua's regime. So they loan him money. Now, why does, he like, why does he want money? Well, he travels to Europe, and he enjoys traveling to Europe because he's treated as a royal monarch. 
and boy, I would like to build some of these castles here. This, I want some of these on the Hawaiian Islands. In fact, Hawaii, the nation of Hawaii, is the only state or, to have a royal palace, the Iolani Palace. So it's a, it's, and it's the only nation that was absorbed as an independent nation, in, stitched into the United States, as I said in 1959. So he wants some of these palaces. It costs money. Here you go. Thomas Edison will come over and wire him up. Bang, he's got to get paid. The missionary boys are concerned that as the, as, as the king travels and in need of money, and he's making sounds like this or noises like this, that he might sell the Hawaiian Islands or, or he might sell Pearl Harbor for the right price to maybe the Dutch, the Germans, the Brits. The Brits for a while controlled the Hawaiian Islands. And so, but we don't want that to happen. So we are going to net him, if you will, into a system of debt. Palaces, you want a small navy? Okay. Uh, here's some money. You, you do a great deal of traveling, fine. What we would like in return, we don't need a quick repayment at all. What we would like to do is we would like to advise you and become part of your cabinet, you see, and to advise you as to proper policies you know, that will aid you and abet us as we continue to buy up more and more land. And by the way, the only reason that Lydia, Mar the only reason John Dominus proposed to Lydia is Queen Lily, who is that she is the sister of the king. Now, a good way to network in is to marry the king's sister. And John Dominus becomes the governor of the island of Hua'u. He has no interest in her whatsoever. He never socializes with her. They never have any children. He has a number of children without benefit of clergy. I like using that phrase from time to time. It's a great phrase. Nobody knows what it means, present company excluded. And, and so, 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 so Lydia is alone. She is left alone, and she has this philandering husband who married her for access to her brother. Now, that obviously is clear to her after a while. And she's a lonely, unhappy, childless woman. And her, her brother is just running up the national debt, if you will, of the, of the royal household. And these white guys, these Caucasians, these plantation owners, are saying, here's more money, here's more money, here's more money. May we buy more land? Uh, may, we, may we have the benefit of Hawaiian citizenship? Absolutely, absolutely. And may we vote? Absolutely. And so they begin to control the king from the inside, who really initially does not see any of this happen. But they could, they're able to work with him and work their way with him because he governs by fiat. He doesn't have to go through a Congress. He has advisors, but his will is the law. He's like Peter the Great. So he governs by fiat, which is fine as long as it's working in our direction. And it slowly begins to dawn on the king that he's failed his people and that he's given away the land. And the, and the missionary boys Use, an, use a, a rumor to make a move on, on Kalakaua. And the rumor is that Kalakaua, in traveling to China, has made a deal with local opium merchants in China to sell land, very fertile land, the crown land, to these opium merchants who can, sell op who can grow opium on, on, on the Hawaiian Islands. And we don't want that competition. I don't, I don't think opium can compete with sugar cane. And, but there's a market for sugar cane. Certainly if we can get the Hawaiian Islands annexed. So this is going on here. And what, the, what, <clears throat> what Sanford Dole will do, Sanford Dole and Lauren Thurston, is they're going to gather up the, their, their muscle, the Honolulu rifles, and one fine day they show up on the grounds of the Imperial Palace they ring the doorbell, I don't think so, and out comes the king 
and they confront him with the Honolulu rifles. Hands up, if you will. Hands up. This is a coup d'etat. We're taking over. We are going to turn, we are going to strip you of your absolute power and turn you into, for want of a better phrase, a constitutional monarch where we will tell you how to run the islands of the Hawaiian Islands for these days and all days. And in, in the Hawaiian culture today, in the Hawaiian history today, it's correctly referred to in a very patriotic way as the bayonet constitution. You know, hands up. Here we are. You're out of business. You're now a constitutional monarch. We're going to run the show, and you owe us. You're done. You can stay in the imperial palace, but you're done. The bayonet constitution. And, and, and Calic Howard comes to understand the disservice that he's done to the people of Hawaii, what's really happened here, and that the annexationists have seized control. And he grows sick. He becomes depressed. He's not the same anymore. These parties aren't as much fun as they used to be. And he travels to San Francisco for medical care, and he dies. His body is brought back. He's buried on the Hawaiian Islands. And his sister, at 53 years of age, is now queen of the Hawaiian Islands. Now, while all of this is going on, again, we need to remember that back in the United States Congress, that there are eyes on the Hawaiian Islands, that there's money being exchanged, uh, that President Harrison has, has made a, that he's under the influence of the sugar planters, that I'm going to recommend uh, that the Hawaiian Islands be annexed. We have it as a stepping stone to the trade with Asia. It will be a military base for the American Navy and American air power, not air power, rather, American naval power as it projects itself across the Pacific. And so all of this comes together as, as the queen comes to the throne and she rips up, she comes to the throne in 1891, the bayonet constitution is 1887, and she rips up the bayonet constitution. That you took advantage of my brother, he was sick, he was uncertain, and I'm the new sheriff in town. And she rips it up and she reasserts her authority as king. Now, we can't have that, can we? I mean, we had, we had, we had Kalakawa, David, in our pocket, and here comes this witch, and they begin to refer to her as the black spider, as a, as a, woman, who, a woman who engineered a coup d'etat against the lawful government of her brother, a constitution that he accepted and signed and lived by until that great man passed. And she has come in like a black widow spider. She's ripped it up. And again, it's the turn of the century. A woman doing this, acting like Catherine the Great, and now signing her missives and saying, from now on, I will rule as by fiat, by decree, as my brother had until you stripped him unlawfully of his power, and she begins to sign the documents, Rex, king, queen, if you will, by fiat. We can't have this, this witch of a woman. My God, she doesn't know her place. She ought to be knitting. You know, we need to turn her out and, and, and get her out of that imperial palace and bring her down to the beach with her surfboard and tell her, hang 10, you are done. We need to get her out of here. She's messing everything up, and we're getting strong vibes from Congress you know, that, yes, we are prepared. And, and President Harrison has, is planning to present a bill to the Senate to have the Kingdom of Hawaii annexed to the United States. And now this woman is in the way. We have to get her out of the way. Who is this woman, this beast? So we've got to set her up. So, Sanford Dole, Sanford Dole, and, and Lauren Thurston go to the American minister, if you will, the representative from the United States on the Hawaiian Islands. His name is John Stevens. 
And John Stevens is a big bull and bear of a man who shares the antipathy toward the queen. And, and it, is, it is Sanford Dole and, and Lauren Thurston who tell Ambassador Stevens, Representative Stevens, you know, there are only 2,000 of us white guys on this island. And we feel threatened. Our land will be seized. We are fearful that our throats will be cut by this wicked woman. And that all the good work we've done here to build this island up and to draw it closer you know, to the United States, all of this will be jeopardized if she remains in that imperial palace one day longer. We need your help. Now, John Stevens is working with this guy. He said, I understand your concerns. What can I help you with? Do you have a plan? Do you have an idea? Yes, we do. And I know you know this, sir, that last week the USS Boston arrived at Pearl Harbor and there were 162 Marines on board. And every night, my children whine and cry. They're fearful for their lives. My wife is beside herself, fearful for her life. We could be over, over, overthrown, overrun by these, by these Hawaiians, our throats slit, beheaded, and our, our heads you know, displayed on a pole. I mean, these people can be savages if we, if we don't stop this now. We need, to, we need to depose the queen. What's the plan? Here's the plan. She's ripped up the Constitution. She's an illegal monarch. It's a coup d'etat. She's spoiling every, all the good work we've done, all the good work her brother did. I recommend, we recommend, that the Marines move onto the Imperial grounds, fully armed, bring in a couple of Gatling guns, and dispose her. OK, sounds like a plan. So one fine day, you know, 150, 160 Marines in full battle gear, and they have their bandoliers of ammunition on, and they have their rifles, and they roll in the Gatling guns. You know what those are, those machine guns, if you will. They roll them onto the imperial grounds, and, and the queen hears a disturbance out in the courtyard, and she comes out on the balcony, and suddenly it's, Hoo! you know, the, the, this is an interesting greeting. Is, is this an American custom to greet me with fixed bayonets and a, and, a, and a rifle and rolling up these weapons. Now she has a strong, loyal imperial guard who are armed as well. And they come to attention and they are, they are prepared to defend the palace and defend their queen, you know, who is restoring, if you will, the rights of Hawaiians. She does not want a bloodbath. And what she does is she tells her imperial guard to stand down, stand down. There will be no bloodshed, and I am not going to surrender my authority to these thugs. And there he is, the man who will be the first gov uh, president of the prov provisional government of the Hawaiian Islands. I am not going to surrender my authority to that thug, and that thug is Sanford Dole, and that other thug is Lauren Thurston. I will vacate the Imperial Palace, and I'll go next door to the Washington Palace, which is like, it's like Camp David, when you want to kick back, maybe have a, have a luau, you know, and, and a couple of beverages, and maybe do the hula and play the ukulele, and, and, and to be able to kick back a little bit, we go to the Washington Palace. I will withdraw from the Imperial Palace, and I will surrender to a, to a man whom I think is a, an equivalent of mine, the President of the United States. He will do the right thing. Grover Cleveland, President Grover Cleveland. He's a good guy. He's a Christian. He knows the commandments, thou shalt not steal. And he will understand these thugs, these thugs have stolen the Hawaiian land, they've stolen the Hawaiian future, they've stolen our economy, and he will do the right thing. So I will surrender temporarily to President Grover Cleveland, queen to a king, not to these thugs. Leland, so Sanford Dole and, and, and the, now the occupying powers, they come in, they ransack the Imperial Palace, they clean it out of everything, they boot her out, and they sandbag the place, and the provisional governor, waiting for annexation now, is, is Sanford Dole, and he suspends, the, he suspends the writ of habeas corpus. He disarms the Imperial Guard. He 
pro prohibits Hawaiians from carrying weapons or meeting in large groups, that he closes the press, that he arrests people who are sus suspected terrorists, that I am in control here. We run down the Hawaiian flag and bang, up goes the American flag and preparing to be annexed. Now Grover Cleveland, when's the last time you heard of Grover Cleveland? Never, never. There's no reason to hear of Grover Cleveland. Basically, he had, he had, he had been uh, he, mayor of Buffalo, um, governor of New York, and was a good guy. He was in, in an age of all the stealing after the Civil War, the, you know, the era of good stealing, if you will, that he was a pretty straight guy, a clean guy, and, and, and ran a, and, and, and was not, and his administration, unlike that of Grant, was not at all tinged with, with, um, with, with graft and corruption and so forth. So Cleveland gets word of what's happened here, eight or 9,000 miles away, and he wants to do the right thing. And he knows there's been a seizure of power. He's not quite sure what's, what, what's going on on the ground, but I'm going to send over what you and I would call a fact-finding mission. I want to find out what's going on here. And he sends over a hard-bitten hard -bitten Southerner by the name of James Blount. You might remember the name Blount from politics in the 20s and the 30s. And he sends him over to do a full field investigation. It's, you know, boots on the ground, what's happened here? And he's there for four months, talks to everybody, and he makes a number of recommendations. He, he puts together a 2,000-page report that, boom, you know, lands on Cleveland's desk. It's like, are you familiar with the phrase, a white paper? You know, the State Department issues a full investigation, ben ben Benghazi, a full white paper. So this 2,000-page white paper, bang, lands on Cleveland's desk, and it condemns what the missionary boys have done and recommends that John Stevens, the ambassador, be fired, recommends that the Imperial Palace be vacated, that the American flag come down, that the Hawaiian flag go back up, that the queen be, 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 be placed back on the, back on the throne, and, 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 and that this whole thing is a complete coup d'etat, absolutely wrong, wrong, wrong again. So Cleveland reads it over. These are different days. You can't text somebody. There's no phone. There's no winter state highway. He can't drive from Washington to Honolulu. And so he's, he's looking at this. And while, and while, and while he's looking at this, and, and Lauren Thurston realizes or, or knows what the report's going to be, he makes a quick trip to Washington, D.C. to talk to his people on the, foreign re on, the, um, on the Foreign Relations Committee, John, Committee's, John Kerry's committee, to have them look into it. And he said, listen, listen this guy, you know, this guy, uh, this, this, this report that you're going to hear about is completely wrong. We were in danger of our lives. Our children were going to be massacred. There were only 2,000 of us. There are 90,000 Hawaiians, and this woman is not to be trusted. I tell you, there is a great evilness here in this woman. And this James Blount was trapped by her you know, and, and, and wrote this, tr this report that's completely untrue and does not reflect accurately the situation on the ground as we know it, we live it, we fear it. And we want you to take a look at it. So the, the Center for Foreign Relations takes a look at it and they have, they have, sounds very contemporary, doesn't it? We have hearings, we bring in witnesses, and so on and so forth. And after a three month hearing, they say, you know what, James Blount is completely wrong that this coup d'etat, this seizure of power was just and necessary and an act of self-defense against a tyrant who ripped up a lawful constitution that these men helped to write for the recently departed and long remembered and revered King Kalakaua. So now we got, so this lands on Cleveland's desk. Well, what have I got here? Do you two guys visit the same country? You know, what's going on here? So he wants to govern a country. He sends a directive back to Honolulu, to the, to the leaders of the provisional government, to get out, take those sandbags down, restore the queen. Leland, <clears throat> Sanford Dole, absolutely not. This is an internal affair. We stand our ground. And Cleveland, Cleveland was not a guy looking for trouble. Cleveland, I'm not going to dispatch American Marines 
to attack American Marines you know, that are guarding the Imperial Palace. I'm just not going to do that. I don't need that headline. I don't need to send Marines against Marines. It's too internal. It's too divisive. It's too embarrassing. I've got a country to run. So I've got two reports. I, I've got this provisional government, this guy, this guy Sanford Dole, who's refusing to stand down. So you know what we're going to do here? We're going to create another committee. Congress does that very well, don't they? We have a committee. And let's have a committee on a committee to find out which committee is telling the truth. And then we're going to have another committee report. So you know what happens. It goes down that black hole, doesn't it? And it just disappears. What doesn't disappear are the loyalists to the queen, the royal guard. And they are loyal to her. They know what's happened. They know what these, what these missionary boys have done. And while the queen may not want bloodshed, we on her behalf will draw blood and we will seize the palace back, oust the marines, we will butcher whoever needs to be butchered and, and help our queen take back Hawaii for us. She is too generous, she is too kind, she is too law-abiding. Sometimes you can't, you can't bring a knife to a gunfight. You know, we need to ratchet it up. So the Imperial Guard, they network, if you will, and they've got weapons, and they gather at Diamond Head. And the word, and we're going to gather at Diamond Head, we're going to rearm, we're going to plan, we're going to take back our country. We're going to, we're going to kick out those howlies. We're going to restore our queen. And there's always someone who's a collaborationist. There's always somebody on the inside in return for money, in return for a position, and the word leaks out that there's a, a, a counter coup being organized by the Imperial Guard. So the Honolulu Rifles are summoned, and they go down to Diamond Head, and there's a shootout. And the Imperial Guard throw down, throw down, throws down their weapons. They run. Over 300 are arrested. Uh, they're brought to Honolulu to be tried for treason and to be executed against the lawful provisional government of, of, of Sanford Dole and the United States people, and we're about to be annexed. And we're going to grab the queen as well. She's arrested in, her, in, in Camp David in, 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 in Washington Place because you must be behind us. You witch. I know nothing. No, you lie. You all lie. You're behind us. And they're doing, the, and, you're, and while you are clean on this, they're doing good and necessary work for you. So guess what? We are going to bring you Lydia Dominus, and they charge her as Lydia Dominus now. We are going to bring you before a military tribunal. Speaks for itself, doesn't it? A military tribunal. We are, we are arraigning you as Lydia Dominus for treason for attempting to overthrow the legitimate provisional government of the Republic of the Hawaiian Islands. What say you, madam? Not guilty. Bah! This is a military tribunal, and she's found guilty. Two things happen. She is fined 5,000 bucks and sentenced to, now she's 50, so now she's 53. She's, and that's old, in 1893. She is sentenced to five years of hard labor cutting sugar cane. Now, that is a death sentence. That's like breaking rock. $5,000 fine, a five-year sentence cutting sugar cane. These men, who we also have arraigned, will be executed. They'll be hanged. However, since we are fair and honorable men, we will offer you a deal. Here's the deal. We'll offer you a deal that we will not follow through on this fine and this hard labor in the sugarcane fields, and we will not execute those men of the Imperial Guard whom we found guilty of trying to overthrow our legal government. If you will do this, if you will renounce for all time your, your effort, and not your effort, you will renounce the name of the, you will, you will disband the royal family, and you will no longer claim that you are the queen of Hawaii or any of your ancestors. You are done. You are done. It will spare your life, 
and spare the lives of those members of the Imperial Guard. It would be as if members of Parliament went to the, the, Roy, the Royal Palace, Windsor Palace, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, and they got Queen Elizabeth out of bed and said, you know what, you're done, sister. You're done. Either get out or you're going to be, you're going to be cut in bog in Ireland. You, know, you, can, uh, you can cut that peat. You're done. It's not going to happen. I have said that, though. I have said that. You know, how to get rid of the royal family. It's just an unnecessary expense. It's a hangover, you know, from the Romanoffs and the Holands. So, boy, I get calls on that. You know, I do a little TV program down by, down by the college, and I love doing that just to get people aggravated because when I go shopping, I hear it. What do you mean? The Silver Jubilee, yeah, it's nothing. It goes all the way back. It's, it's antiquated. Put them out of business. Turn it into a Holiday Inn and be done with it. <laughs> all right? And be done with it. You know, the time of dynasties is over. I just do that just to ag aggravate people. And I do. I hear about it. I hear about it. But I love it. So she takes the deal. And as part of that deal, she will become an American citizen. And, and also, she will make an effort through California courts, and that's going nowhere, to retain some of the crown lands. These are lands that belong to the crown. Did you see the film by George Clooney? The, what was the name of that film? Descendants. Pardon me? The Descendants? Yes, The Descendants. I mean, while it doesn't talk about that, it just shows the beauty of the Hawaiian Islands and, and about land being bought and sold to, to developers. And of course, he's the, he won't sell to the developers, will he? And that's where, that's where the film ends. But she becomes an American citizen. She sues in California courts to be able to get some, some restitution and to be able to hang on to some of the Crown lands. All of that is thrown out as not having any standing in a California courtroom. And you know, you know that a judge rules the courtroom, and you better know who that judge is. You have no standing here. So she never gets a dime. And she dies of a stroke at the age of 79 in 1917, at the outbreak, at least for the United States, the outbreak of the Great War with Woodrow Wilson. Annexation and statehood in 1959. The, the Spanish-American War erupts. And with the outbreak of the Spanish-American War, thank you, Theodore Roosevelt and William McKinley, and all the other things we've talked about, that we grab the Hawaiian Islands as a territory and annexation. Now we grab the Hawaiian Islands, and we grab the Philippines, and we grab Guam and Wake Island. We look to grab Cuba. I'm surprised Cuba never became a state. Uh, several times, beginning with Thomas Jefferson, there was money on the table to Spain to buy Cuba for short money. And I've always been surprised that Spain simply didn't give it up in the New World and sell Cuba you know, for a couple of million bucks. And that Cu I, you know, Cuba has more business being a state than those distant Hawaiian islands. But grabbing Cuba, grabbing the Philippines, grabbing the Hawaiian islands, Guam and Wake Island, grabbing Puerto Rico, and annexation, territorial status, statehood in 1959. Daniel Inouye, who is revered among Hawaiians, Senator Daniel Inouye, who passed away two years ago, 18 months ago, that he introduced in 1993 and it was signed by President Clinton and, and also accepted by the United States Congress, a measure called the, the, it, was called the it, was called, it was called the Apology Resolution. And the Apology Resolution was quite simple, that you recognize, you Americans, you recognize that what you did was illegal, that this was an unlawful seizure of power, the ouster of a queen, a land grab of epic, epic proportions, and and, that, and Clinton said, you're right, I'll sign off on that. The American Congress said, we'll sign off on that. And then when that happened, Inouye and others who sponsored the apology resolution hoped that would be an opening for the next step. And that is, we want the people of Hawaii want the native Hawaiians, pure, pure Hawaiians. There's only eight or nine, 10,000 left. Because today, I mean, Hawaii is a mix, isn't it? It's a mix of, uh, of Dutch and Brit British and French and German, an enormous amount of Japanese and Chinese, 
who are on the Hawaiian Islands. And the reason they showed up on the Hawaiian Islands, it had nothing to do with their, it had nothing to do with trade. When the local Hawaiians refused to cut sugarcane, the planters had to get laborers from somewhere. And they got them from Japan and China. So that's why there's such a, a large amount of, a large number as a percentage of the population of Japanese and, 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 and Chinese. So now that you've accepted the apology resolution, the second step to that we, we feel is we want the crown lands back to the native Hawaiians, purebred Hawaiians. And Congress and Bill Clinton said, uh, you know, I don't think so. We said we're sorry. Uh, that's, that really should be enough. I mean, we're sorry. And, and these lands now really belong to the government of Hawaii, not the Hawaiian people. And it is the government of Hawaii who will determine the disposition and the use of these crown lands. And that's where it stands today. There was an effort to get the Supreme Court, John Roberts, to take a look at it. That never happened because we all know this today that you know, particularly at that level of play, the Supreme Court can hear what it wants to hear. They don't have to hear anything. In fact, they can pay, take a paycheck and go home. I mean, they choose what they want to hear. If four justices want to hear it, it gets heard. If not, it gets remanded back to the lower court, and that ruling stands. And that happens most of the time. I mean, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of cases that make their way to the Supreme Court. Uh, they only hear about maybe a buck and a 125 you know, maybe, yeah, about tops, 125, 100. So that's never been resolved. And the Crown lands are now the possession of the government of Hawaii, and they have been since statehood. And you've got an apology for me. What else do you want? Uh, I said, I'm sorry. What more do you want from me? I want half the estate. Hey, come on. I said, I'm sorry. I'm not giving away half of the estate. We're not giving away the crown, the crown lands. So that's where the story is today, and statehood was accepted in an overwhelming vote of 94%. Again, it's trade, and it is the Cold War, and protection, and the Japanese had their eyes on the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, they had their eyes on the Philippines, and when Theodore Roosevelt adjudicated the Russo-Japanese War, he told the Japanese, look, you can take Korea, you can take Korea, but the Philippines are ours. So going right down to December 7th, 1941, we, we have the effort to take, back, to take the Philippines and also to push the United States out of the Central Pacific. So there is a long and convoluted story, and I'm going to give you homework here. I'm going to give you an assignment, and you can just tell me when it's going to be, and I'll, I'll make sure that the press is there to cover this. All right? And, and all you need to do is to, what's, what's, the, what's the local, is it Roach Brothers Stop and Shop? Roach Brothers. Would that do? Close enough for all of us? All right, here's your assignment. This is direct action protest against what happened to the Queen. We're going to gather in the parking lot, and you need to bring a can opener. Bring two can openers. The press will be there. We are going to march to the juice aisle. We are going to grab pineapple. Uh, we're going to cans of pineapple juice open them up, pour them onto the floor, and say, to the queen, to the queen, for the queen. We understand what happened. Direct action protest. And we have been mobilized. We have been mobilized by Gary. And we are with him. We will gather in the parking lot. All you need is a can opener. And we'll march together to the juice aisle. Wouldn't that be great? For the queen, for the queen, and pour it all over the floor. You'd get some air time, wouldn't you? You know you'd get some airtime. You also know you would be arraigned. You also know it would be all over the country, wouldn't it? Look at these wackos. They've got nothing to do but to celebrate the memory of the queen, whoever that was, for the queen. Would you have to give up their uh, gold pineapple? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, you ought not eat pineapple. But, but we don't buy pineapple from the Hawaiian Islands any longer. It comes from Costa Rica. I mean, that's, now, the Dole name is still there, but I don't know who owns Dole Pineapple, maybe Campbell's Soup or MGM or, or Kanoko, who knows, but for the queen. And to me, that's your homework. So let me know when it's going to happen. I'll call the press. I know a guy at WBC. They'll bring the camera crew in. We'll all line up, and we'll do a little, you know, and then in we go. It'll be brilliant, won't it? But... 
No. No, no, no. You will be banned forever. So before I leave, is there anything I can help you with? A question? You'll never cut, you'll never have a piece of pineapple again and think about it the same way. 